Amen. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. In review, let me read this for you. This is from last week. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all with all your soul and with all your mind. And I can't wait to get into each one of those later. This is the great and first commandment. Loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So, as you can see, God expects us to love. Being a loving church is incredibly important. You could say it this way. The reason you're not in heaven yet is so that you can love. So that you can love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. What does God want you to do down here? He wants you to, say it with me, love. He wants you to love, absolutely. This is an important topic to consider especially in this day and age. But it's also a very important topic to consider because of the sin in our own hearts that so often goes against love and the nature of love and the calling to love. And so we want to be a loving church. We're commanded to love. We want to love. I want to love more. Do you want to love more and better, more purely, more self-sacrificially, more like Jesus? Absolutely. And so to that end, we're going to go to one of the most famous passages on love in all of the scriptures. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and this is our text for today. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned as a martyr, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. Paul, tell us more about what love is, the nature of love. Well, it is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Amen. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully been known. So now... Faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is, say it with me, love. Amen. You've probably heard this text before at a wedding. Raise your hand if you've heard this text at a wedding before. Terrible verse to read at a wedding. Terrible. Don't do it. Don't do it. This is a rebuke. The Corinthian church was a hot mess. And Paul is trying to... Help them to encourage them before it's too late. It's a rebuke. It's a warning. It's a terrifying warning, really. It's a terrifying warning. He says, if you can speak in the tongues of men or of angels, that is, if you have been given some supernatural ability to speak in a language that you did not learn or study, whether it be the language of men or the language of angels, whatever that is, if you can do that, okay, but if you have no love, then you are nothing. Wow. Wow. Have nothing, are nothing, becoming nothing, accomplish nothing, zero, zip, zilch, nada, die, go to hell, nothing. Even though you speak in, in, in mysterious, miraculous tongues. He says, if, if you prophesy, and, and what it means to prophesy is to speak inerrantly, perfectly, the will and the knowledge of God. If you do that, 
And many people prophesied, especially in those days, the 70 apostles, the 12 apostles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you do that and you do not have love, then your life is meaningless. It is without any meaning whatsoever. It is nothing. You say, well, how can, you, how can there be a prophet who doesn't have love? There's plenty of prophets that didn't have love. Balaam's donkey, I think, comes to mind, right? If you prophesy without love, you are a donkey. That's right, you are a donkey. Your, your prophecies are true and accurate, and God might use them to help other people, but you're a donkey, or worse. He says, if you have all knowledge and understanding, understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and if you, have not any, if you have not love, you're nothing. And I think that's the scariest of all, really. Because I think that one right there, probably closest, clo- most closely, is talking to Christ Church. I think that one right there. Because I think we know a lot around here, you know. Um, God gives every church different um, blessings and benefits. And some churches are known for their strength, they love God with their strength, and they're very they're activists, and they're engaged in the community, and they're eradicating poverty, and, they're, and they have programs, and, and, and they establish institutions. They're go, 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 and they have a lot of strength, and they love God with their strength, and that's awesome. And we have a little bit of that. I don't think we have a ton of it. I'd like more, amen? Then there's other churches that love God uh, with their heart. They, they're passionate. They're zealous. Their, their worship is, is, uh, is filled with zeal and passion, and they, and they really do connect with the Lord, and, and they follow the Lord with their emotions. I, I think that's great. I think we need to improve in that area, too, I think. And then there's churches that, uh, you know, more soul. And, and when you love God with all your heart, soul, that word soul probably is referring to your, your communion with him. And, and, and there's churches that are, are very strong in spiritual disciplines and, and everyone is getting together uh, in small groups and praying and having prayer groups and they spend time communing with the, with the, Lord, the Lord the way Jesus would be off by himself or communing with the Father. That's what it means to love God with your soul. And there's churches that are strong in that area as well. But, you know, I think if we had to pick one of those that we are the strongest in, I think it would probably be mind, I think. Right? I think your pastor is a logic teacher, right? We like doctrine around here. We know a lot of stuff. I think we could probably do pretty well in a Bible drill, in a Bible trivia game compared to most Christians. And I know our kids could do really well with that. But if we don't have love, our lives are nothing. Amen? Nothing. And you know what? It's terrifying, really, because the Bible says that to whom much is given, much is to be expected. And, and to put it just bluntly, the more you know and you reject, the more you know and don't receive, and, and, and the hotter your hell will be. It's going to be terrifying to live your entire life thinking that, that you have got it made, that you've arrived, that you're um, prophesying and speaking in tongues and you know all sorts of theology. You know what God thinks about all manner of subjects and die and go to hell and your life be nothing and meaningless? That's terrifying. It's sobering. I told you it's not a wedding passage. I told you this is not, you don't read this at a wedding. It's very sobering. It's terrifying. It's a warning. It's a warning. Jesus speaks about these loveless souls in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read that for you on the screen. Matthew 7, starting at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty, many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's not a surprise that I want any of us to experience. Amen? I don't want any of us to to be on that day, Lord, Lord, we believe in the sovereignty of God. We're reformed. We know what it means. Jesus is Lord. We know, in fact, that he's Lord over even the civil realm. We know Jesus is Lord. We believe in the sovereignty of God. But do we have love? Does he know us? Is his love inside of us? Amen? Or we did mighty works and Many miracles and gathered large crowds. But do we have love? Does he know us? 
Are we working the law? Are we following the law? And what is the essence of the law and the summary of the law? It is love. Do we have love? Or are we loveless? Which is another way of saying lawless. I think the, the most terrifying aspect of Matthew 7 is that he says many on that day, believing in the sovereignty of God, working great mighty works and miracles, gathering crowds, eradicating poverty, giving their life to be burned as martyrs, etc., etc. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and I will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Many, not few. If it said few, I'd feel better, right? You'd feel better if it said few. I'd even take a several, right? But it says many. many. That's sobering. That's sobering. We had better make sure that we have love. And we better make sure before the time is too late. Amen? Pastor, I hear you. I'm with you. When I leave here this day, I'm going to start loving. I'm going to do it. I'm setting my mind to it. I'm going to start loving. I wish it were that simple, really. You know, I wish that willpower could save the day. But you can, you can conjure love up out of nothing as well as you could conjure up a banana out of nothing, right? You could just make a banana appear in your hands right here, you know, or an apple, or a cannonball. If you could do that, then you could perhaps conjure love. But you can't. You cannot conjure Love, because love is a fruit of the Spirit. And the word that Paul uses is agape. It's agape. Would you nod your head if you've heard that word before, agape? I think most people generally, especially if you're in the Christian world, you've heard of agape. It's a Greek word. It's translated love or charity, generally love. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, that's the Spirit of God, God, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's agape. You see, Pastor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start loving. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want my life to be nothing. I want it to have meaning. I want to have significance. I don't want to be a banging gong or a clanging cymbal, just a loud, annoying noise that God hates. I don't want that. So I'm going to start loving. You, know, you, can't, you can't conjure love. You can't just will it into existence because it is a fruit of the Spirit. Amen. What does that mean, a fruit of the Spirit? It means that in order for you to love, the Holy Spirit of God, God himself, must plant himself in you, so to speak. God is love. He must plant himself in you. He must plant love in you. And, and then over time, as he nurtures it and cultivates it and waters it and, and gives it sunshine and, and protects it over a period of time, gradually, your love begins to grow and, it, and, it, and the sap of the Holy Spirit begins to fill your veins and go out to the branches and eventually the love in your life blossoms and you look different, you act different, and you feel different, and people think of you differently, and things starting to change, and then that, those blossoms turn into fruits, which are edifying for others to eat and to enjoy. You see how that works? That's the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Are y'all with me? Amen. Amen. I told my Sunday school class, if they start getting bored and looking sleepy, we can just wrap this thing up. No, we're not. We're, we're, everybody's here with me, right? I want the fruit of the Spirit. I want to be a loving person. I want you to be loving people. But you can't just, you know, conjure up bananas, right? We need the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. And, and so what do we do? Well, you can ask for it. I think that's it. You can ask for it. Amen? You can't make the Spirit do anything, but you can ask the Spirit. And he says, if you ask, you will receive if you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be opened unto you. I think that's so important. You can ask, and, and you know what else you could do? You could repent of your sin and not do things that grieve him. I think that would, that would go a long way. You could, you could go to church every Sunday and say, Lord, give me love. I don't exactly know where this comes from or how to give it, to get it, but I, I, but I know that if you're going to give me love, you, maybe you would do it in church. So I'm going to go to church. I'm going to sit under the preaching of every word. I'm going to sing praises to you, but I ask that you would put love in my heart so that my life might blossom, so that it might be edifying and enjoyable for others to taste and see, so that I might not be a banging gong in your ear but it might be beautiful music. 
Right? That's what I want. So that I might be something, have purpose and significance. I want to have love. I want that. I want that. Who wants that? Now, I will tell you this. If for, for anyone here, and there's a few of you, and, uh, and we are, you know, we are ecstatic when new people come to our church. Ecstatic. We love it. All the pastors, we love it. We talk about you, and we're excited that you are here. But we really, really love it when non-Christians start coming to church, right? And then it, it kind of looks like they've maybe become a Christian. Now, we really like that. That's exciting. To, to be a part of, of someone becoming a Christian is so cool. It's so exciting. You know, pastors don't always get that. You get a lot of people that they move from the other part of the country and they come to your church, but they've been a Christian for 20 years. But it's so cool when you get someone who's not been a Christian and they're like, okay, I mean, we're going to try this Christianity thing out. And they, and they come to the church. So if that's you, and there's a few of you in this room, I want to talk to you directly, and that is if God puts love in your heart, and I hope that he has, and I hope that he will, and I hope that he continues to, and I hope you're praying and asking for it, this is what's going to happen. Everything is going to change. Because when you have the, the sap of love flowing through your branches, the Holy Spirit of God, who is love, put inside your heart, everything changes. Your perspectives change, your desires change, your emotions change, your purpose changes, the way you live your life changes, the way you spend your time and money changes, your relationships with your husband or wife or children or neighbors, everything changes. Love changes everything. Love changes everything. And if you begin to, to blossom and you begin to recognize, whoa, that's not how I would have behaved years back, right? And other people begin to see you blossom. It's, so, it's an exciting thing. It's an amazing thing to be a part of. Amen, Christ Church? Amen. Love revolutionizes everything and uh, gives you uh, not nothing but something, significance, purpose. Makes you beautiful music to the Lord rather than a banging gong. That's what I want. Pastor, I'm so glad you're talking about love and I'm really glad that you're talking to the non-Christians about how they need to start being loving, right? I'm so glad you're doing that, right? But listen to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Here's for the Christians in the room. You've been Christians for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. This one's for you. Hebrews 13, 1. Let brotherly love, that is affectionate love from the heart to one another in the church, let brotherly love start. Is that what it says? No. You can't let, you know, if you're a Christian, it started already. But though it has started in you, and the Holy Spirit has planted love in you, and, it is, and he is cultivating it in you, you have a part to play, amen? Love is planted in you first when you become a Christian, and that's, you're sort of passive in that. You ask. That's what you do. You ask. It's about all you can do, and he puts love in your heart. But then now that you have love in your heart, and, you're, and you have the Spirit of God, there's a lot of stuff you need to do other than asking. You understand what I mean? You, you need to cultivate it. You need to pray for it more. You need to do it. You need to actually love others. You have to let it continue. And if you don't actively let it continue, Christ Church, you will sour on the church. You will sour on the people in your life. And what was once love for the brethren Passionate love, self-sacrificial love, patient love will become irritability and resentment. And you will find yourself drifting away and away and away. Let it continue. Amen? You know, have you ever heard of the seven-year seven itch? Have you heard about that? Come, it was made popular from a Marilyn Monroe movie many years ago, long before my time. But it started off as the idea that every seven years you sort of get dissatisfied with your, your husband or wife. And you get that seven-year itch, you start looking for someone else to fulfill you and to satisfy you. Now that seven-year itch is applied to everything. Like every seven years, I got to get a new job because I just don't feel fulfilled in this job anymore. And I need to get a new friends and I need to get a new house. And, and we've probably all, I think it's a real psychological thing, the seven-year itch. But I've seen as a pastor the seven-year itch in church people. 
And every seven years, their love begins to wane. And it's no longer as patient as it once was. It's more rude, more irritable, short-tempered. You know, everyone else's flaws start to look way bigger than they used to. And they, you know, just go to a different church. And every seven years, they just keep on doing that. That's not letting your love continue. That's not. That's not how it works. That's not what we're called to do. We are called to let our love continue. Amen? That means cultivating it, stirring it up, praying for it, doing it. Revelation chapter 2 verse 4. This is also a terrifying passage. This is Jesus' letter to a church. Jesus says this, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. The love, what, what are you talking about, what love? Your love for God and your love one for another. You've abandoned that. You had that at some point in time, but you've abandoned that. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. You were up here. And now you're down here. Repent and do the works, that is the works of love. You did it first. And if not, I will come to you. And that does not mean the second coming of Jesus. That's judgment language. I will come to your church by my spirit and remove your lampstand. That's an Old Testament illustration for taking the lampstand out of the temple. Like you're no longer, you don't get the presence of God anymore. You don't get the Holy Spirit anymore. Keep your rituals, keep your, your loveless, lifeless shell of a church, but I'm out of there. I'm out. Like you can be a, like one of those cicada shells, grotesque, prickly, that are stuck to the side of a, of a house. You've seen one of those. You can have your shell, but you don't get me. You don't get life. You don't get spirit. Because you didn't repent, and you let your love grow cold. We have some responsibility in this, you see, to to make sure we're stirring up and cultivating love. And I'm not saying these things because I think we, I don't think we're exactly where this church is, but I don't want to ever be there, okay? I don't want to ever be there. Unless you repent. See, that's the good news. He's telling them before he removes the lampstand. The word repent is always just another way of saying, I got some good news for you. You can change now. It's not too late. Such good news. Yet this you do have, he says. They're not all bad. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. That's good. Listen, there's more than one way to have your lampstand removed. One way to have your lampstand removed to have the Spirit of God leave you, is to not hate right, and to not hate what he hates. We should hate the works of the abortionists. We should hate the works of the feminists. We should hate the works of the socialists. We should hate the works of our regime. We should hate all the things that Jesus hates, we should also hate. And we should hate it with a pure hatred, a Jesus Christ-like hatred. I think we need to work on that, honestly. I'm not sure we hate enough as a church. I think as long as the checks are still in the mailbox, we're okay. I don't think we hate enough. But I also think the most important thing to learn is we have to also love as Jesus loves. Just because you hate all the right things and, you know, you're an activist and you line up all on the right social issues of the day properly, just like Jesus does, that's great, but that's not enough. You have to love. Amen? You have to love. So, just real quick, do you love the church? Do you love the brethren? Do you still love, do you still love them? Or has your love um, waxed or waned? Which one is the one that's going away? Wane? Or has your love waned? Or has your love waned? Jesus loves this church. Jesus loves Christ's church. He does. He loves us. He loves all of his churches. Amen? He loves the church so much that he came to earth and died on the cross for his church. It says in Hebrew, in uh, Isaiah 61, we were looking at this last Wednesday, it says that Jesus says that I will not be silent. He says, I will not be silent, and I will not stop shouting, and I will not stop working until Zion, the church, shines with righteousness. 
Jesus never gives up on his church. He loves his church, and he's working with his church until his church is a beautiful, shining city on a hill for all the nations of the world to see, amen? He loves the church. Do you love the church? You should. You've got to. You've got to. You say, I, I don't mean, did you love the church? I mean, do you now? Amen? I don't mean, do you love the vague church? The vague church. I don't, I don't mean Christians. I mean, I hope you do love Christians generally. I hope you love the Chinese Christians, and I hope you love the Japanese Christians. But you know, they're probably never going to irritate you. Right? They're never going to not let you have your way. Right? <laughs> they're so easy to love. Right? It's like uh, having an online boyfriend. He's just perfect in all the right ways because you don't know him at all. He's not around, right? I don't mean do you love Christians. I mean do you love the people in this room? That's what I mean. That's the real test. Do you love real people, real Christians in this room that, that you're looking around and saying, do you love from the heart? That is so absolutely important. And if, if it is waning, you must repent and you must stir it up again so that Jesus doesn't come to us and, and remove his presence from us. I don't want to be in a church that's like a cicada shell. I want life. Here's a couple of diagnostic questions, and then we'll be done. And I get these from verse 4, from verse 4 of our text. Love is patient. So are you patient with people in your church? Um, I should also say, are you patient, patient with your family? Because that's important too. Right? Are you patient with your kids, your students, your employees, your neighbors? Are you patient? Are y'all still with me? Y'all still with me? Okay. Are you patient? Well, you know what that means? It means you can put up with stuff. That's what it means. Long suffering. You can put up with insult and injury. You can put up with it. You can let it roll off your back. You've developed the spiritual discipline of a thick skin, and that is a spiritual discipline. Are you able to turn the other cheek? Do you tolerate other people's qualms and preferences and offhand comments and slights and jokes and sins? All right. Or are you quick to assume the worst, hear things in the least charitable light? You know, Jesus suffers long. He is patient because he is love. Amen. So ask yourself, am I, am I walking around here like a porcupine, bristling and irritable and resentful? We've got all these lists of things that everybody's done wrong. Then you need to repent and stir up your love for the church once again and ask the Lord for a patient love for the people around you. Amen. One more diagnostic question. Are you kind? Are you kind? What that means is, are you, do you have the divine ability to continue being useful to another person? To be kind, the word is literally useful. Are you willing to say useful things, do useful things, write useful things, act in useful ways, even when they might be irritating you? I mean, that's what it means to be kind. Now, not everyone's irritating you. So I hope you're kind to those people, right? But even the pagans do that. Anyone can be kind to someone who's kind in return. No, we want to be useful one to another. So I don't mean did you used to be useful to the people in your church. I mean, are you now? Are you living a kind life? You used to tithe. You used to serve. You used to go above and beyond. You used to enjoy people in the church. But now you don't so much. That is the waning of love, and it must be repented of. And here's the good news. If you repent and ask the Lord for help, he will help you. I promise you. I have a lot of prayers that he has answered. So I can testify to you, he answers prayers. Amen? And, and he will certainly answer this prayer. Help my love to stay warm and hot for you, Lord, and for the people in this church. And, of course, for everyone. For everyone. For everyone. Amen.